Awesome. Welcome to this session of Win Loss Week. I'm here with Catherine Bennett. Super excited about this session. It's going to be fun to uh, reminisce about the good old days in an architecture firm and RFPs and that whole world. Today, we're going to be talking about using Win Loss Intel to win more RFPs. If you're not familiar with Lupio, they're an expert on RFPs, the RFP process, how to make it better, faster, and more efficient, and how to win more with your RFPs. So Catherine Bennett is a perfect fit on Win Last Week. I'm super excited that you decided to uh, join us on this. Well, thank you. So I'm excited today too, to talk to you about how Lupio and the entire proposal ecosystem can benefit from debriefs within the, within the closed world and elsewhere. So today, here's what we're going to be talking about in our session. We'll get to meet um, our, our wonderful speakers here today. Um, also a discussion, a short discussion about how debriefs can shape your proposal efforts. So this is kind of like a mini panel exercise where we are going to reminisce about our time in, in uh, professional services marketing and we're going to discuss strategies for you to be able to improve your own debriefing sessions. And then there are some next steps and additional resources that Lupio would love to share with you all about debriefs. So with no, with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I will introduce myself. I am Catherine Bennett, the Director of RFP Excellence here at Lupio. I have 12 years of experience as proposal manager, proposal specialist, marketing manager, everything up and down the line. Um, Currently at Lupio, we offer proposal automation software that helps speed your time to value and eliminate the hassle that comes along with submitting RFPs um, so that you can improve your win rates, have better efficiency, and just generally have more fun as a proposal manager. Um, Trenton, what about you? So I'm the director of marketing at Closed. Um, I started my marketing career in, in a small architecture firm that we grew really quickly. So I'm really familiar with the RFP process in that world. And then I jumped ship and went into SaaS uh, and have seen RFPs and, you know, from both the buyer side plus uh, the vendor side. And now as the director of marketing with Closed, we specialize in win-loss analysis for people that are unfamiliar with us. And I sit a lot of, I spend a lot of my time inside of our platform looking at the win-loss reasons of huge enterprise B2B companies. And a lot of those are RFP based win loss data sets. So mm -hmm. I have a, I feel like a deep knowledge of how to use win loss to improve your RFPs now. Wonderful. So here's an exciting topic and I'm really excited for us to get in on it. So let's talk first about why we need to conduct debriefs for proposal managers. So win loss is a key part of your proposal. Ultimately, if you don't know what grade you got on the paper, you can't go forth and improve your paper. So what happens if you're a proposal manager and you don't know what winning content looks like? That's something that's been very high on top of mind for me recently because Lupio is really great at content management and we're really great at helping you find the right information. But how do you know that's the winning content? Um, if you don't conduct debriefs, if you don't talk to those customers about the ways in which your content is affecting those decisions, you may keep submitting the wrong information and you think you're doing okay, but there's no data to back up why you're winning or why you're losing. So you may just keep doing the wrong thing or you may accidentally happen onto the right thing and you don't know about it. So from my perspective, I think that data helps us drive that message to the right customers at the right time. And the debrief to me is arguably the most important part of the proposal process, um, just because it's what helps us understand the next step. Uh, Trenton, what are your initial thoughts on these concepts? Yeah, I mean, from my background in the services industry, like I mentioned that architecture firm, a lot of times when I was running marketing there and coming up with uh, these content themes or the the content for these RFPs, a lot of times it was guesses like, what do I think are our winning points? What are our differentiators in this architecture firm? And it's such a services based industry that a lot of times it comes down to talent. So I thought, man, the pedigree of this architect in our firm and the work they've done is is the winning theme. But your RFPs have limited space. Like you don't get a million words to really like explain that. So it, it becomes crucial that you identify what do your buyers actually care about and what you think they care about may be completely different. Like they might not give a, they might not care at all about the person you're highlighting um, or the reason you're highlighting or what you're highlighting about them. They, that might not be helping you win the deal like one bit. So for me, 
um, you have to get it from the word of the buyers. Like you have to understand what really motivates them, what's motivating this RFP. And ideally that should be a built kind of relationship based from the sales team before you even get to an RFP. Cause you know, there's a lot of situations where just a blind RFP doesn't, doesn't always win. Um, but, but on top of that, uh, that, that data should be, you know, now that I'm in marketing, I'm kind of very, uh, biased. I lean towards talking about that more than anything else, but <laughs> me before your company even gets to RFP, the positioning, what you think your company wins on and how you want to communicate that should already be kind of a strong point in the people reviewing the RFP's mind. A lot of that comes through the marketing and the sales process, right? Yeah, so yeah absolutely. Yeah, it's gotta come from the buyers and you've gotta gut check it with them. Absolutely, absolutely. Getting those buyers feedback into our process is so critical, so critical. Oops, excuse me, I'm sorry that I, <laughs> I'm sorry that I skipped ahead. Okay, oh, um, so let's talk about our individual experience with debriefs. Trent, when you were at your architecture engineering construction firms, did you have a debrief program or what did you, like how did you get win-loss information? Um, there was no time. <laughs> we were small and, I, and we see this still today. Um, like I've done really large data set surveys about win loss programs for really mature enterprise companies that you would think would be able to buy the time and buy the resources. And they still struggle with having these, these programs really fully mm -hmm. built. So for a, a person in a small to medium services industry, architecture firm type business, it's going to be brutal. It's gonna be really hard. I mean, you, you're, you're sitting there kind of living paid check to paycheck as a business, right? Like you're thinking about what's the next project that we have to win. Cause I just mm -hmm. hired three more people. And if we don't fill the work, then I'm going to do that churn and burn thing that a lot of services firms or service industry companies fall into. So for me that it, it, uh, it, we just didn't have the time to do it. And a lot of times the debriefs would become an internal focused conversation mm -hmm. um, about here's why we think we lost it. And a lot of conjecture, like, oh, we just didn't have a good enough relationship with them or such and such firm already had been talking to them, has done 10 projects with them. And, and those may have been valid reasons, but we don't know for sure if that was it. Right. And a lot of times yeah. because we were a smaller firm, our, our, uh, our strategy was kind of, let's come in and see if we can undercut on price, which wasn't the best strategy looking back. Um, but if we had done some debriefs, we would have understood that more. Uh, there was one time where I did have a good relationship with somebody and I took them to lunch afterwards and just talked to them about like, Hey, can you help me understand what's going on here? We thought we had a good chance. And they, we went into a deep conversation about like, you guys were so cheap that it looked cheap. It looked like we were going to have our building fall apart. So if I hadn't have had that conversation and taken that back with at least that data point, we would have always kind of tried to compete on let's undercut and do a, do a cheaper method. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so that's my, that was my experience in the architecture firm was there just wasn't time. We had to move to the next RFP. We would kind of change things up. Well, I think we wrote about, we wrote this way this time, last time, let's, let's focus on a different uh, differentiator or let's change the messaging a little bit because we think it'll help, but we're really just like guessing and trying to wordsmith things when we have no clue. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can, I can understand that because I've worked in places that did not have debrief, uh, debrief programs before I got there. But I think yeah. um, through the, the SMPS uh, CPSM program that I went through, they really heavily stressed the importance of debriefs. And that's why I was grateful. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Society for Marketing Professional Services, they have a great certification program um, called Certified Professional Services Marketer, which is like very, a big, a big mouthful, but it's really, really helpful when it comes to running marketing and uh, professional services proposals. Um, so when I, when I come into a department and have to build it out, which is what I've had to do on a number of occasions, debriefs are always something that we get started in the first quarter. Um, and at the last company where I worked, we did kind of a, no, we hadn't really, we hadn't really focused on it, on it very well, but what we did was just a mass debrief kind of at the end of the year. Uh, we took all of our, we took all of our, um, 
projects that we'd completed, got all the contact information and just did a did a blitz because we needed to get a really strong understanding of what was going on. And I would say we got it about 10 to 15 percent. So um, out of, you know, 200 proposals, that's a pretty good that's a pretty good return. And we were able to make some really good decisions around that. But every every organization where I've worked luckily has either had a debrief program in place, thanks to the business developer or um, or I, I've gotten one. In, I've gotten one up and running pretty quickly because I recognize the importance of it. We can't if we don't know what what we're doing right or wrong, and what we're doing right is often really important too. We just can't make good decisions about content structure, any of this. So team members, right? So so yeah. Um, so that's really interesting that you you come from one that is like depleted, and I come. So but we have similar challenges, right? Like we we have a lot of the same issues, regardless of whether the deeper program is spun up. Yeah, I mean even. Even after in my career, when I left the architecture firm, which was small, right, and went to larger SaaS tech companies, um, the debrief process there was pretty siloed. Like you would get a lot of internal communication with maybe a couple people, a sales rep or somebody like a product marketer would talk to the sales rep and be like, do you know why we lost this deal? Or if it was a very big logo or a big contract, you would get the executive team involved mostly on a loss and when and a win, they almost wouldn't care. They'd be like, this is great. We knew we were going to win it, whatever. But on a loss, all of a sudden the whole world is falling apart and everyone wants to know, we thought we were going to win that. What happened? And it's interesting to me how rare it was to hear in those conversations, somebody say, I went and spoke to the buyer or I spoke to the buyer committee or anybody on the customer side. And wow. These are the top three reasons they told us. Like sometimes you'd get a sales rep, they'd be like, oh yeah, they told me it was just not the right time or it was priced or something like that. But the the feedback they got was so high level that no one, everyone was just like, oh, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. and no one had any like sort of strategic takeaways. So even in bigger companies, you know, where where you would think it would have been implemented, it, it wasn't a truly great experience either. So. Yeah, and I've got to talk to, I've got to talk real quick about this idea of like debriefing when you should have won. Like people ask, and I think this is the next one, um, like, should we debrief every proposal? Let's talk about like the, yeah. the, because what you just described is something that happens a lot within organizations where I've worked specifically. High stakes proposal, we put a ton of money into it. Um, we think we should have won it. Oh no, we didn't. Now we're debriefing. But, it, but if that's the only information you're getting from a win-loss perspective, that's not that's not providing you with a coherent picture of what's happening within your business units. So like when you're making those decisions, should it be the executive team that's driving the debrief? Like what like what should we be doing in your opinion? In in my opinion, if you want a winning culture in your company, your company needs to be able to to stomach the truth. Is how I heard uh, one person say it right, oh. and have a culture of. What are we doing wrong? What can we do better and be humble? No matter how big or how much you win, right? Everyone can have improvement. No one wins at a win rate of 100% that I've seen. Um, so yeah, I think it should come from the entire executive team. And I mean, it already is. When they're in board meetings, they get asked all the time by investors, by the board, why do you think we're winning and losing? I've, I've spoken with a, with a few VC investors with a few board members of various enterprise companies. And they say that question comes up all the time. And then it goes around the table and everybody answers it kind of differently. But once again, like I said, it's super rare for it to be said in those types of meetings. And with those, those questions for, for someone to say, I've talked to a hundred customers recently, and this is what they're telling me. Usually they, they're wow. thinking from an internal perspective. So I think if you want to build a winning culture that cares about why you are winning and losing deals, which everybody should care about, it should come from the executive team with their sponsorship. And then obviously mm. they delegate the uh, driving of that program to, to different stakeholders. But, um, and then in response to this, should we, you debrief every proposal? Obviously I'm a little biased on this question because <laughs> this is the service we provide, but at the same yeah. time, um, I think you should debrief every proposal, but I think the level of depth on the debrief can vary, right? And you should use your CRM as your compass. Mm -hmm. Your CRM data, 
see what it's telling you already. Cause some of the stuff you're going to be like, well, we kind of knew there was no way we we're going to win that. Like to go back to the architecture experience, we would waste time in my opinion, and we should have used our CRM to not even invest the time on these, but we would waste a little bit of time on, Hey, let's, let's try to go get this huge, uh, school project or this big hospital. And we had never done a project like that. So it was like, how in the world are you going to win that? Right. So yeah. you should use your CRM to point you, but at the same time, maybe we became, maybe we came close to winning and it's worth like trying to figure out how do we invest in that area, that segment, that product, whatever it is a little bit more to win there. Right. Um, yeah. but yeah, I would, I would use the CRM as a compass to guide the, your channel of data you get on the debrief. So for example, at, at closed, we, we talk a lot about multi-channel win loss programs. And what we mean by that is you have essentially two channels of feedback. You have buyers and your internal feedback, which for the most part comes from the sales team or, or a CX, a customer success team. Mm -hmm. And you can get feedback from both of those channels through really the best ways are surveys and interviews. Um, so, so if you, if your CRM tells you, we don't really win over here, we didn't have a very good chance, you should at least kick out a survey like that. There's, that's easy, right? Yeah. Got a very easy to answer survey. You can get a lot of data that way, um, to your sales team and to your buyers and at least get some sort of data points there. Of, you know, how close did we get? Or is it worth investing further into this segment or product or whatever it was? Um, and then on the larger, more important deals, you use your CRM to kind of guide you. Well, where do we win the most? Where does the most revenue come from? Maybe that's what you, the, the points you use, or it could even be, man, we need to crush this competitor. So you segment your CRM data to which competitors are we going after? Let's go debrief on those ones to figure out how to win against them next time. So um, that's, that's yeah. what I would, but I, yeah, I would, I would do some form of debrief on every proposal for sure. Yeah. I love, I love what you mentioned here about using your CRM to point you in different directions, because from my perspective, like, listen, yes, you want to debrief every proposal. And for many of those of us who are on the phone right now or watching this webinar, you just, the pressures that come with the organization dictate the fact that you, you're not going to be able to achieve that no. goal, right? So, so in talking to some industry experts recently, what I've kind of come to come to understand is that there are a lot of different models that you can follow. You, like you can follow that, oh no, we're on fire. The executive team told me to do it, right? That's kind of the lowest level of, of, of um, advancement in this domain. It's like, we're going to de debrief what the ex executive team gets upset about, right? The, yeah. not, the, not the best model, but if you think about kind of how to advance that, the next step might be you, and you debrief the what you thought you should win that you didn't or or certain high stakes customers if you don't have the time to do every one of them maybe you look at certain high stakes customers in certain verticals or, or certain industries where you're trying to mm -hmm. penetrate more more mm -hmm. frequently right um or you think about it you know and that's that's how you kind of transition into moving into making it a, a an organizational habit to debrief on every on every um, opportunity. And here's the thing is that proposal teams can shape what the rest of the organization is doing. Like what you're describing here about the, the funding sources, they, they want those information, uh, those little nuggets of information about what's happening. So if as a proposal team, you could drive the entire sales team towards being able to, oh, Sorry, uh, you could drive the entire sales team towards debriefing and doing win loss calls. And you could be the ones who originate that process. You could be the ones who originate that best practice. So good on you for making that decision, right? Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I feel like there's an awful lot, I feel like there's an awful lot of benefit to debriefing every proposal. But if you can get a statistically significant sample in the right industries, you can also drive, drive, you know, yeah. revenue ahead. So totally. yep. And I and I would think about it. We get asked the question a lot especially when companies come to us to do a buyer interview program, it, it's, it's cost prohibitive. Like we send out mm -hmm. very talented consultants to do zoom calls like this with your buyers and their adaptive, deep interviews. It takes time and can, you know, a high quality talent consultant isn't inexpensive, right? So mm -hmm. our per interview price might seem a little bit prohibitive. Um, so it doesn't, a lot of times it is tough to be like, Hey, let's do your entire pipeline and let's interview everybody. Ideally that'd be amazing, but it, it it's cost prohibitive. Right. 
And if you're doing this internally by yourself and you're not hiring a third party, good luck. Like the time that it's going to take to do that is brutal, especially if you're a proposal manager thinking about like, I would love to kind of DIY this and populate the information to teams that matter and, and kind of like highlight, Hey, I'm a, I'm a forward thinker. I know how to improve things. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I always preach to people in different companies right now, like especially sales ops people, they, they think about win loss in, in this way when I'm like, you should kind of take the helm before anybody asks you to and think of the amazing uh, opportunities you'll get if you show the company why you're winning or losing, right? So yep, I totally yes. agree with you there. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be cost prohibitive. So, you know, it does make sense to identify in the CRM, your CRM data, like which, which segments should we go after? Because it's yeah. going to be tough to cover it all, especially in the beginning too. If you're starting out DIY, you know, all the time, but it's better to start than to be perfect is what we kind of always say. Yeah, I love that. And also in our proposal um, teams, we, okay, I'm of the mind that if you spend 80% of your time planning, you spend 20% of your time executing, you're probably going to have much better execution. Debrief falls into the planning stage, right? Like you're not, ex- it's not value added work necessarily. Like it's not, or it's not, it's not billable work. Okay. But, but, but what I find so much is what do those winning proposal shops do? They spend a ton of time thinking about their buyer persona. They spend a ton of time thinking about why they're winning and losing. They assess their pricing. They're looking at their competitions, proposals, if they're looking at, if they're you know, proposing into the government space. So like the more time that you spend setting up those dominoes, your win rate's gonna go up because when you push the first one down, they're going to fall. And the debrief is such a critical part of like of that planning yeah. process, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, let's, let's think about that as we move on to this next question about oh. how can process mapping help you with explaining the need for debriefs? And for me in the proposal space, um, I'm so I'm a Lean Six Sigma green belt. I love process maps. They're like one of my favorite things in the whole world. Yeah. Uh, I think that what happens a lot of the time is that when we're thinking about completing proposals, we start at when we catch the proposal, and then we talk about how we work the proposal and all the content we put in. Everybody, you know what we do, and then the the process map stops when we submit. And nobody considers the work that needs to be done after that. And within Lupio, for instance, a lot of work needs to be done as far as recommitting information back into the library so we can go back to use that again. So we think about about closing out the project. But I've used process maps also to describe, hey, you know, the process of proposing does not end when that submission goes in the into the customer's hands. We have a lot of work to do after that. So that's that's the perspective that I like to take. And that's why I draw it out and submit it to my leaders so that they can see exactly how much work is required. And then we estimate the amount of time. So this would this would therefore play a role in estimating our capacity because closing out a project is just as important as initiating a new one. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day, actually. Um... So a lot of, and this isn't, this is true with a lot of companies, there's R and D and then go to market is on this side, right? They're over here developing a product. They think it's going to work. And then you build a go to market teams like sales and marketing. How do we put that product that R and D created into market? And it could, you know, R and D that sounds very much of a software process, but it could also be for a hardware product, or it could be for a services thing. Your R and D is how do we, build a services team that can execute on projects that need to happen. Like in the architecture world, if we wanted to win some of those bigger hospital deals, we probably needed to bring in an external hire that had a ton of hospitality or hospital experience. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And then you'd build that go to market team and then they execute. And like you're saying, they kind of kick that proposal over the fence, see if it wins or not. And then they just keep going. And what's missing in a lot of this process that companies are doing when they're building a product, then going to market is truly understanding why they're winning and losing the deal. And then cycling that information back through R and D go to market and then executing again. A lot of times that, that, uh, process in this overall process comes down to these internal ideas. Well, I, conjecture. I think this is what the market wants. I think this is why we're winning and losing people throughout all the time. Like, well, Steve jobs didn't really listen to the customer and he did the Henry Ford thing of (laughs) if we listen to customers all the time, all Henry Ford would have done is build a faster horse. Right. And to me, that's totally wrong. Like that's not how it worked. Henry Ford wouldn't have built a faster horse. He would have listened to the customer and understood that 
they wanted their horses to move faster. Maybe they didn't want to clean up as much manure as they had to anymore. Maybe they didn't want uh, to feed the horse all this food they had to grow. Maybe they didn't want such a smelly mode of transportation, right? And he still would have used his innovative mind to solve those problems and you would have had a car. As the same with, with Steve Jobs in my mind. A lot of people say, well, if he had listened to customers so much, he wouldn't have innovated like he did. And I, I think that's dead wrong. I think he knew customers, for example, the iPod, they wanted to carry as much music around with them without a huge bulky device. Like it's it gets you to the same conclusion, right? So I think a lot of companies are missing this in this process map. So to me, it's a simple... Uh, it's one of the reasons I joined Close. It's like, this is one of the biggest components in a company, go to market, try to make a winning company process map that's missing is this amazing feedback from actual buyers on what to do next. And yeah. it's, a, it's a challenging job. Like people that go out and try to do it on their own. I've tried to do it on my own from like a product marketer standpoint. I'll go out and interview uh, buyers and, and try to understand why we won or lost the deal. And honestly, I'm like, I'm mediocre at best at these interviews. I don't really know exactly the right questions to ask. And if I yeah. do a solid, amazing interview, all of a sudden, I don't know what to do with the data. I'm like, well, I took all these notes. I'm going to just kick it over to somebody or I'm going to go talk about it in a meeting and then it kind of dies there. Right. So yeah. for, for us, win loss and debriefs, should be an integral part of your process and it needs to be moved away from this is a one-off project based whether that's executive team wants to know about one deal or it's a one-off project for three months about a few deals it needs to be operationalized embedded in your culture how do we win and become a programmatic process right and the other reason absolutely yeah the other reason we preach on that is especially with SaaS like it changes so fast. You, you're doing two week sprint cycles with new features. Your competition is doing the same thing. New paradigms of how to solve problems are introduced like quarterly. Uh, there's no way to say we're going to do a win loss program or a, or a, or a project for three months for one quarter. And then that's valid in two quarters. It's already, it's already removed from the, you're already removed. Like it doesn't even make sense anymore. What you, the data. Yeah. Is. That's a really good point about how fast things change. Like, oh, we understand our customers. Well, do you understand them now? Yeah. You understood them three months ago. Oh, three months ago, two months ago, a year ago. Like, yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot, especially with these kind of like, um, these kind of uh, monolithic uh, uh, old, like kind of legacy types of businesses like legal and and yeah. uh, architecture, engineering, construction. Yeah, well, we understand our customers. And there's there's a lot of old ideas that persist. And that's a really good idea. Like how how do you kind of, how do you kind of update or how, what frequency do, do, you, do you report out on this information so you can make sure to operationalize it? And I think that's really important as we start thinking about um, how we start thinking about our return on investment, because obviously what we're trying to drive towards at the end of the day with all of this is better win rate, better mm -hmm. revenue, better, more, like more money in the company coffers. That's the whole mm -hmm. point of proposals. And that's the whole mm -hmm. point of what we're trying to do with debriefs and win loss calls. Yep. And from my, from my perception is that the proposal debriefs, you're, you're going to get a better return on investment with every submission. If you've got the right content, you've got the right form. And let me tell you, you know, what you were talking about earlier about about submitting for a completely inappropriate project. I've got a really good story about that that kind of ties in here. We were, I was working in a software company and we decided that we wanted to propose at this, um, for asset management at an airport, but it wasn't just the airport, it was the airplanes themselves. But we had never uh, undertaken a project to, to manage airplane asset management. And of course there are many special softwares that are out there for that, okay? So we proposed, and I, and I call the folks up and I, you know, I was, I was dubious. I was like, I don't know that we should propose on this, but these people are saying they've got a good relationship. Like, okay, okay. You know, it's boss says to pull the trigger. Let's go. So I called them up and they go, like, this is one of the few times I've ever been like openly laughed at as a professional, which was horrifying to me because they just laughed and they're like, we don't understand at all why you proposed on this. You, zero out of 10, like you, we, we don't even want to give you the scoring sheet because you did so bad. You cannot right. meet any of our requirements. And I was just but, but, but without that phone call, which I recorded <laughs> and, and took, took extensive notes on, but without 
that evidence, I couldn't have gone to the leadership and been like, okay, this is not the type of thing we can propose on. And this is not the type of thing that we can expect to get any financial, any financial benefit from. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to call it a gotcha, but like, if it's a bad decision and we find out that it's a bad decision, let's make sure that we're communicating that so we don't make it again, or that we take steps. Like if that's a target market, let's take the steps to get into that, to get into that, um, you know, specific role so that we don't represent ourselves so poorly. Um, but I think that the deep risk can help improve your ROI so significantly because for me, I'm not going to chase bad work. If I've been told your, you know, your software doesn't really work for this, I'm not going to go after that because the customer told me no thanks. Yeah. Right? Uh, is that has that been an experience that you've had as well? Yeah, absolutely. And you, when you were talking, it made me think of. Um... I have a colleague that's a VP of marketing at an advertising technology uh, SaaS company. Mm -hmm. And he uh, complains to me, it's probably just the right word. Uh, he complains a lot about the executive team thinking they should win every single deal because it's almost like an ego driven, we're so smart and what we've built is so amazing. There's no way people can't see the value of this and we're going to win everything. So they spend a ton of time chasing outside of their, their prime target win zone, right? Like they win really well at a certain company size when a marketing team that needs this platform is at a certain headcount in a certain industry, all of that kind of stuff, but they're trying to go after everything. Right. And he, he tries to tell them all the time, like, we should double down where we're winning. Like we'll go so much faster. We'll waste so much time if we double down where we're winning. And the feedback it gets is we should win everywhere. There's no reason we shouldn't win in these other areas. Right. Uh, and it goes back to that same conversation of why do you win? And it's it's rarely centered around what your buyers are actually telling you. It's my, my baby is so beautiful. There's no way she can never like lose in the pageant that I put her in. Right. Uh, that's maybe a weird metaphor, but that's the way I feel. <laughs> um, or like my kid's so talented. He's of course going to win every soccer game or become, you know, the next Lionel Messi. Like it, it's just mm -hmm. people get so invested in their, in their product that they've sweat blood and tears to build that they think they can win with, with it anywhere. Um, yeah. So, so to me, it's like, not only does the debrief data give people inside the company a guiding light to actually go to s people that are the stakeholders, they're going to kind of change the strategy or drive the strategy and say, look, this is what I mean. Like the buyer laughed at us when we sent this RFP. There was no yeah. way we're going to win this. And this isn't a one off event. Like the last 20 times we've done this, they've almost laughed at us. We just have never asked them if they laughed or if they thought we were amazing. Right. So it definitely can improve your ROI by helping you focus where you win more. So immediately you're going to get rid of the crap that you don't ever win. So your ROI per submission is improved. But mm -hmm. it's a lot bigger than uh, the ROI per RFP submission, because I do agree that you can refine the RFP message, the RFP content really well and get it totally fine tuned to a winning RFP. But it's a lot broader than that. If you do this debrief win loss process well and you democratize the data, internal stakeholders like in the product team or sales, marketing, they can dive into that data and they're the experts there. Like your product people are experts, right? They can pull their mm -hmm. own insights instead of you trying to go to them and tell them all the time, this is what I think is wrong with your product. Like let them come to that conclusion with the buyer's perspective in mind, right? Yes. Um, so, so that's the other way it can help. Like if you keep your, your submission by just tweaking the language of your RFP can only help so much at some point your product, your offering, your pricing, whatever it is that your buyers are saying is the reason you're losing has to improve. And you can't do that with just a small language tweak in the RFP. Yeah, I think it's so critical. Many of our proposal teams don't realize the power they have to shape product features. So um, there are ways that we did reporting on uh, the outcome of RFPs. So we would, um, we would show the sections in which we performed particularly well or identify 
uh, you know, correlate win rates with the percentage of product features that met X, Y, or Z criteria. And you can elucidate really interesting conclusions from your proposal uh, efforts because they are, especially if you're proposing it to the government, they have to give you the information. So you you can get you can get so much product insight if you're the proposal person. Like you can be the person who's driving company strategy. And I really wish more people recognize that. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here really quick because there are there's we have a couple of questions here, but I'm particularly interested because we are kind of running a little bit short on time. I'm right. interested here because we've been talking. You mentioned the fact, and I hear this all the time in my world too. We right. lost on cost. Okay, I, if I hear it again. I <laughs> I'm probably going to openly weep in my office, right? Like sure. the reason that we're losing is the, like costs. What, what we have found here at Lupio in speaking to people who are procurement experts and folks who are buying for not only the government, but also for private entities is really this word value. Uh -huh. It's not about pricing exclusively, like that's a component. But what you described about the fact that you were underpricing yourself made people suspicious. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really easy in, in two ways for, for us to focus on pricing. Number one, it's, our, it's those internal assumptions like what you're describing. Oh, well, we must have lost on price because these people came in lower than we did. Yep. Okay. But also sometimes the customer doesn't want to tell you the real reasons that you lost and they'll just say, well, price, yeah. right? Um, so for in my, in my experience, the way that I dive deeper than pricing is I just don't really even ask about it in the debriefs. Like it's a very small question and it's all the way at the end. Mm -hmm. I talk about the value that we deliver. Did we demonstrate that we understand your needs? Did we demonstrate that you that that we could meet the timelines that you had set for us? Or, or was the team reflective of the type of skills that you needed to have, have uh, employed on this project in order to be fully successful, right? Um, and I think, I think that we just so often get stuck on price. The way I avoid this too, is I don't involve the salesperson on the debrief call because I feel like they're going to point it towards price every time. And God bless them. They're, they're, they're wonderful people, but yeah, they, they get laser focused in on that money component, right? So sure. in your opinion, like, so I ask questions that don't really have to deal with price and that focus more on value. What right. are some of the strategies that you use to dive deeper than just the pricing as well? Because it's a big, big, big problem. Yeah, absolutely. So we talk in our interviews and in other uh, methods, we talk a lot about like, how much did you trust that this brand was going to be able to execute? And mm. that comes back to the ROI. So, and we, we term it the same way. Like how, what did you feel like the ROI was going to be or not going to be? Did you feel like you understood the value or not? Um, so a lot of, and you're exactly right. When, when someone just says, your pricing was, you were too expensive, right? Which is one you hear about all the time. It's rarely actually just a dollar for dollar amount, unless you're talking about like some super commoditized item. But even then it, it's rarely just that. Um, like for example, in a recent buying experience that I just had, um, I was evaluating a videographer and um, I actually went with somebody that was uh, almost, 6x more expensive than the other proposal that came in because I felt like I could trust that that team was going to deliver full value. I wouldn't have to worry about it and it was going to be executed well. Um, and if in your sales process or in your RFP process, your buyers don't feel that trust from your brand, they don't feel like they're going to get that return on investment that they're putting in with money and time, you're going to lose every time. And if your yeah. salesperson goes back and asks, can you tell us why we lost? Um, it's going to be pretty rare that you're going to have a very transparent buyer that's going to say, when you took me through the sales process, you made me feel like I can't trust the company because you didn't follow up with me enough or you didn't communicate your product well enough or you couldn't answer my questions well enough. Like it's pretty rare for people to be that blunt. One, mm -hmm. They're still in negotiation mode a lot of times Two, They don't have time. Like just like us trying to get debriefs done. We don't have time. Do you think the customer has time to go help you with your debriefs? Probably not. They're moving on too. Yeah. And then three, like the world's still a good place. People are usually kind. They're not going to just tear people apart in my experience. Right. You do get those people and they're candid and cool, but you, you're usually not going to just have somebody late, like tear someone apart that way. Right. They, they don't yeah. like telling people their babies are ugly. Um, so 
for, for me, um, we dive deeper by understanding, by really trying to figure out, did the buyer feel like they were going to get an ROI out of this? Did they feel the value from it? Um, do they trust that the brand can deliver whatever it is, whatever service they're trying to, to, to purchase. And then the other thing on it is a lot of times it's not just a dollar amount, like it's the packaging and people forget about this too. Uh, so did you bundle your service or your tech in such a way that it was not flexible, that it did become more expensive than the competition, but the value delivered wasn't more. But because it was bundled in such a way with features you think are important, but are just bloat features, they're going to go with a competitor that has 20% less features, still solves the problem just as well or better, and is 50% cheaper because they're doing less features, right? So mm -hmm. it's really important to not just stop at, well, it was too expensive, or yeah, it was just your price. Like it, that's, that's not going to help you change any sort of strategy with your company unless you're not a smart company and you just immediately go and drop your price because you think that's the solution, right? That's, that's going to be harmful. Yeah. I wonder also how many buyers really understand their own icky feelings around certain things. Like, you know, that you made the decision, but I feel like unless I've got somebody who's qualified asking me questions that drive me to understand my own buying choice, like I just feel icky about certain things sometimes. I'm like, I don't know. I don't want that. I want this. Totally. Yep. <laughs> and, yep. But to describe the reason, like for me to actually think very deeply about that on my own would be a really big challenge unless yeah. I have somebody directing me to think about the components of the bid or the buying process that that were important to me yeah. so well, well that's a little bit of a light bulb moment for me too because I don't always know why I choose to buy certain things so we, <laughs> how can we expect our buyers unless we ask them the right questions for them to be able to describe that process to themselves? yeah exactly and that goes oh, back to my that goes back to the, what I said before about like I've tried to run a DIY debrief for win loss uh, program myself. And it, it's challenging like to do a really well done interview that actually pulls actionable insights out is, is really tough. Um, so yeah, I totally agree with you there. And I think a lot of us even, um, to be honest with you, a lot of people are relying on these little like um, survey monkey surveys that they're sending out at the end of sure. which, Okay, you can do that. If it's a low yeah. stakes RFP, um, some 10, 15,000, like whatever. Okay, maybe you, maybe that's all you need to do. But yep. I would I would advocate against the use of <laughs> the use of three question surveys as the foundation of your debrief program. Like to yeah. your point, because what you're going to end up with is just the, the phenomenon yeah. of oh, it was too expensive. And yeah, and, and you know you'll have limited time in an interview as well, so you could use these survey. You could use use the survey data to kind of build out your interview guide. Mm -hmm. So if you do a bunch of surveys, maybe you get 500 survey responses in and they're marking pricing a ton, you maybe get a couple comments on it. I don't know, but you get pricing or you get sales process or something. I would focus your interview guide a little bit there. Like, well, how do we fix this thing? Or what do they mean exactly by pricing and mm -hmm. structure the questions in a way that you can dive deeper on those certain elements that are starting to pop up inside your surveys. Um, that, that's how I'd use the survey as like a guide to the deeper interviews. That's a very thoughtful recommendation. Good for our proposal teams to think about how to lower the burden of time and still be able to get the value that they need. Smart, yeah. smart, smart, smart. Okay, so um, we are, we're doing great on time, but we've got a couple of questions that we still want to answer here. So uh, what I would like to really think about is how do we update our proposal content based on the debrief results? And we see a lot of success with this in Lupio. The folks that, um, so, so what, what Lupio and similar repositories, like any, like many, many software, um, proposal automation softwares allow you to um, store content from previous proposals and access it just a little bit more easily. And so um, what, what we see a lot of successful customers doing in this context is going back into the content that they use for specific proposals. And when they get that feedback of, well, you know, we didn't really feel convinced about X, Y, or Z, they can, they can then um, target their work plan and, and describe how information would be presented differently or how work would be done differently. So for instance, you know, based on, based on um, one of the debriefs that I did while I was actually a Lupio customer myself, I was able to go in and say, you know, we did not describe our own past performance 
with any credibility here. <laughs> so, and the, and the customer told us like, we didn't think you'd ever done a project that was similar to ours in the past, but in fact we had, we just had right. not done a good job describing it, unfortunately. Right. I'll take ownership for that. I could probably, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. but, but the fact is that I was able then to go into those past performance examples and flesh them out more thoughtfully because I had that actionable content from the people who were doing the buying. And the next time we used those past performance examples, guess what, we won. Mm -hmm. big 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 improvement so so how else like i know we think a lot about buyer personas we think a lot about what does winning content look like but like how do you think we can shape our proposal content based on the results that we get from win last calls or debriefs yeah um man i feel like you talk for a while on this one um so where, where should i start so the, the biggest thing for me goes back to, are you proving that ROI that we talked about to your to your buyers, right? Are you proving the return of investment? Are you proving that you're gonna deliver the value they need? And you know, they, there's a lot of process before an RFP hits someone's hands in proving that ROI, like I said before, with your with your marketing, with your sales process, with everything. Like they, I think they should have at least some idea who you are, what your brand's strength and reputation is, before the RFP even hits their hands, right? And um, your RFP should be a way to double down on those things. And it, I, I just spoke with somebody that we were talking about the sales process specifically, but it kind of relates to this. And she said, Man, I get so many cold emails where the person is like, hey, my CEO would love to schedule time with you. My founder would love to schedule time with you to demo our product and talk to you about it. And she's like, I don't care who your founder is. I don't care who your CEO is. Like they don't mean anything to me, right? Unless <laughs> we're talking about like, this is Amazon and I'm gonna get on the phone with Jeff Bezos when he's in space, I don't care. And a lot, but these outreach teams are sitting there thinking like, man, if I can tell them about my founder and how cool they are, they're gonna care and they're gonna totally jump on the phone with me. It's kind of the same with your RFP content, right? Like you mm -hmm. think highlighting some amazing thing about your service, your product, whatever it is, is going to just totally win people over and prove that ROI. It might not be doing that at all. It might be a waste of space, a waste of time in the RFP. It might give them the wrong impression. Like like you said, you guys spent a ton of time on RFP, but you didn't even communicate to the, to the buyer that you could provide the service they were actually looking for, even though you've done it a hundred times. So if you're not debriefing and figuring out what's the actual content in our FP that is proving that ROI and helping us win deals, um, you're just kind of throwing out your best guess and your content's mm. never going to improve. The other thing yeah. I'll talk about really quick, I know we probably are a little short on time, but it's buyer personas. Like I like buyer personas. I love product marketers, um, but I think they fall short. I think a lot of companies build these like, PDF static buyer personas as a one-off project. Sometimes they update them, but it's usually when they're launching some new product and that's usually about it. And they're very like generalized, stereotypical. Like I was talking to uh, uh, Chris Walker is uh, the CEO of Refine Labs. He's a great marketer. And he was telling mm -hmm. me about one RFP he got from a company said that his buyer had a lot of tattoos and he's selling like a medical device so it was like, why does this buyer persona even say this? So it's kind of the same thing as you should operate, operationalize and make when the reasons you win, win loss, like part of the company culture, right? And to me, it's all about buyer empathy, like really talking to buyers, really understanding them, putting yourself in their shoes and feeling what they need, not hey, we've got these buyer persona PDFs that everybody in the company looks at once and we check the box that everyone in the company now has buyer empathy and they know how to market and sell to our buyers. Like this is yeah. not, like, you need to be out talking to the customers. And, and I think the best way to do that is talking to them in the context of why did we not win your business or why did we win your business, right? Like, I don't think there's a better conversation with customers that you can have. Um, so yeah, and it, and that data just flows through not only in the content on your RFPs, but it should flow through the entire company. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and it positions you to be in a, in a in a position of trust the next time the RFP comes up, right? The next time the contract is due. If you did your due diligence and you asked what we could have done better, a lot of times that will ingratiate you. And if that primary, if their primary choice falls through, something horrible goes wrong, guess who you're going to be on the phone with? Totally. The minute that project bites the dust, they'll be like, yeah. well, you care, you cared enough. You yeah. cared enough to come talk to me. You cared about my opinion and you want to improve. I'll probably give you my business. Totally. totally. Mm-hmm. Even as a even as a third party, our consultants tell me that all the time. Like they'll be interviewing a buyer for some other company and the mm-hmm. buyer will say, This is so cool, such and such company is doing this. Like they it really impresses them. Like they actually care. Um, and it does exactly that. Maybe you didn't win that one, but it did elevate your brand in that in that buyer's mind for sure. Yes, yes, extremely important. Okay, um, our final question here, and then we'll then we'll move on to key takeaways. How do we communicate with our leaders about debrief results? What is what is? Let's do maybe one or two tactics or strategies that we might use to communicate well, so that we can drive some organizational change. What do you think? Yeah, to me, this one's uh, one of the biggest struggles that companies face right now. Um, I just did a survey recently that was about the maturity of win-loss programs and companies and what, how, how do you communicate your win-loss program data to, to other people, to other stakeholders. And I think I, if the most common way that it was being communicated was either a uh, static PDF or a slide deck. Oh. Yep. So it was like they would send it over the win loss analysis data in a, in a PDF once a quarter. So it's, it's static. There's no way for leaders to dive in deeper. There's no way for them to jump in and read the results themselves and come up with their own insights. They're, they're kind of relying on whoever came up, came up with the debris for the win loss program to provide those insights. And that's, it. that's when the program dies. It's like, Oh, this is interesting. It, it rarely turns into strategic change inside of the company. So for, for us, um, and this is one reason we built our platform is this data should be shared in like a living format, um, in something that can be democratized and scaled. So you can show it to as many people as you, as you can, um, and they can all pull their own learnings from it and start to drive action either personally or at, at the org level. Like one example is we have a, we have a company that has, I think they're at, 700 sales reps now and every single sales rep is inside of our platform every time an interview is done or a survey is done all of those sales reps get an, a notification that's like hey this interview on this one or lost deal has just been posted go check it out and sometimes it's their deals and they just saw oh crap like 700 of my colleagues are gonna see how i did on this one or lost deal and I think that's very admirable like that company has a culture of improvement of coaching of we're not going to use this to uh, like punish anybody unless they did something really horribly wrong. But usually it's, we're going to coach you with this data and we're going to help you with this data. Right? So in the how it should be communicated that way. Like how do you communicate? It should be done in a, in a method of let's improve and help each other. And let's have a humble approach to our business. We know we're awesome. We know we win, but we can improve. Here's the data from buyers telling us how to improve. And then it needs to be done in a way that's scalable, that's living, and that can be shared really easy and really fast. So you're not siloed, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think I, I think what you described there that really caught my attention was this idea of leadership buy-in. Because without I've been on proposal teams where we debriefed until the sunset, right? And we used the information to inform our own practice, but we really struggled to get it in front of the leaders because getting developing the messaging to help them understand the importance of these of these insights was such a huge challenge. So in my opinion, having a leader who already understands the importance of a win-loss, like that's your ideal. If you can find a champion within your organization who already understands the value of win-loss and can advocate you and advocate for you in the upper echelons, then you're going to have far more success with getting traction with additional debrief, maybe getting some more money for a win-loss program, right? Or um, just being able to influence organizational strategy. But to your point, this idea of a static PDF or a slide deck, eh, um, 
Yeah. How we did it in, at previous organizations where I've worked, where we had this technology was built a CRM dashboard where we could atta attach the debrief to every opportunity and then re report on it for every for every debrief that we did. So initially it started off as like an Excel sheet and then we were able to tie it in as an as like a CRM object. But having a dashboard that's living that describes not only like your, your capacity as a team, your uh, your win loss rates, but also the reasons that you're winning and losing, like that at a glance that gets updated every day, leaders yeah. eat that up and then it makes it so much easier for you to report later. Um, but the idea of having a champion, you've just, you've got to, if somebody who's high up in your organization doesn't understand the idea of win-loss, it's going to be the Sisyphean battle of pushing the rock up and down, right? Like, it's just going to be an exhausting day for you. So, so good, excellent points. We are at the, at the top of our hour now. Um, so we're, we're going to skip ahead to our key takeaways. So here's what we've really talked about today. We've had a lot of great conversation around the fact that your debriefs can support market intelligence and how it works within your proposals. So we want to understand how to refine our win themes going beyond, uh, to Trenton's point, going beyond those um, those static buyer personas that got done once and set and forget, right? Um, understanding how those contribute to your proposal efforts, improving your content, and ultimately considering yourself a strategic driver within the organization. Because as a proposal team, you have access to information that is so much richer and so much deeper than many other sales functions. So please, as a proposal managers, as proposal writers or proposal completers, just remember that you are an extremely important component of the sales team and that you can drive vision within your organization. Um, any any final takeaways on these key points? Um, no, I think we touched on them all really well. I just, you know, the, the one thing I like to harp on is I think true business strategy is driven by understanding your buyers better than anybody else. And if you're not doing any sort of debrief and you think and you're assuming what your buyer thinks is valuable to you, about your brand or your offering, um, you could be right, but you could also be wrong. And do you really want to risk that? So do a debrief, do a whole debrief process, build a win loss program and really figure out what your buyer wants and needs. And if you're delivering that, right. So yeah, and I think we should probably are. add on here, check your assumptions, check your <laughs> assumptions. Yeah, do not it. assume, <laughs> yeah, totally. investigate, investigate first. <laughs> All right, well, to close us out, I do want to invite everybody who's attending today to join us from September 28th to 29th for our online virtual conference called Lupicon this year. Um, we have a two-day virtual event where thousands of professional proposal managers and proposal adjacent functions are joining to learn about how to write great content, how to submit great proposals, and just generally network and connect within the proposal sphere. So uh, again, I've been Catherine Bennett from uh, Lupio, joined today by Trenton Brump from Close. And we are happy to have talked to you all about proposal management and the ways in which debriefs can support your process. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time. Thanks.